my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Cord Blood Registry. These days, feeling secure about your family's future health is pretty important. I'm very excited to introduce our new partnership with Cord Blood Registry, also known as CBR. CBR has helped millions of parents bank their children's newborn stem cells. Newborn stem cells have amazing potential for treatments in the future, and cord blood stem cells have already been used for 30 years in stem cell transplants. It's kind of like investing in your baby's future health. For a limited time, CBR is offering the birth hour listeners some pretty big discounts. Go to cordblood.com and use the code HOUR, H-O-U-R, to get 60% off the newborn stem cell bundle, which includes both cord blood and tissue banking. Visit their website to learn more about how newborn stem cell preservation could protect your whole family and why CBR is the number one most recommended cord blood bank by families and OBGYNs. Visit cordblood.com and use code OUR for amazing savings just for our listeners. That's cordblood.com with the code OUR, H-O-U-R. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking with Armina and Michael. They are parents who use cord blood registry to bank their son's cord blood and ended up using it with their second son. So you'll hear their story at the end of this episode. I also wanted to share the link for our Know Your Options Childbirth course. You can go to thebirthhour.com slash course. And right now we have a coupon for you for $100 off. It's 100OFF. So you can use that at thebirthhour.com slash course. You can also see all the information there about the course, including everything that's in the modules. Madison, today's guest, was actually one of our students, and we got to know her in our biweekly Zoom call. So you might hear a little bit about the course in her story today. Today's guest is Madison. Madison had an unexpected cesarean under general anesthesia with her first, and she was planning for a VBAC during COVID with her second. And due to mostly her mental health and decisions she made with her husband, she decided to have a repeat cesarean under general anesthesia, and she felt great about that decision and having control in that area. And she talks about how it was such a positive birth and postpartum experience, especially in comparison to her first birth. So let's hear her stories. Hi, Madison. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Can you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah. So my name is Madison Webb. Um, I'm 29 years old and I live in Corvallis, Oregon. It's about an hour and a half south of Portland. Um, I live in Corvallis with my husband, Heath, kind of like Heath Ledger, like the candy bar. Um, My son, Will, who turned three in December, and my seven-week-old baby girl named Avery. And then I'm an academic advisor for Oregon State University in the College of Engineering and also a small business owner. All right, so we're going to hear both birth stories today. So let's start with finding out you're pregnant with your son and how your pregnancy went. Yeah, he and I always knew we wanted to kind of get married and start our family. He kind of wanted a minivan full of kids, and I was fine with two or three. We started trying right after we got married in 2016, and it really didn't take us very long uh, to get pregnant. I used uh, OPK test strips and read the Taking Charge of Your Fertility book um, and started tracking my temperature rises throughout my cycles. So I had a relatively good idea of what was going on, but I had never really uh, tracked my cycles in that way prior to trying to get pregnant. So it was really cool seeing just the ebb and flow of your natural monthly cycles. So around March, I think I saw my temp dip, uh, which would have been the implantation dip, but I was still unsure if I was doing it right. Cause if you wake up at a random, a different time and you take your temperature, if you move, that can really affect, uh, how your body, body temperature goes. And then I had also used the OPK test strips to try to time things. I didn't really have many other charts to compare it to, but I had this hunch that I was pregnant. Um, so this was April 2nd, 2017. And I was still, I had a hunch that I was watching my temperature rise and I'm a control freak. So I really just wanted to take a test, but I knew that it could come back as not positive, even though it could be a positive, but I just could not handle uh, not waiting to take a test. Um, but I was still four days away from my period. Heath also 
uh, had left me for the weekend to go uh, snow camping at Crater Lake. And so I was just home alone stewing over my temperatures. Like you do. I'm sure people can relate to that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> just like staring and then comparing charts yeah. uh, online. Yep. <laughs> Google images. <laughs> yeah. Google, Google images, uh, everything like, and I really wanted to post on one of the apps, yeah. uh, had someone look at it, but, um, refrain from that. So what I decided <laughs> to do was leave the house and go buy a pregnancy test from a safe way down the street. And the problem is, is Corvallis is pretty small. And then when you work for the university, you know, all the students. And so I'm randomly going through Safeway and seeing three or four of my students and I'm holding a pregnancy test. And it was just, a slew of awkward feelings there. Um, so I check out, come home, pee on the stick. And there is like the faintest line on this pregnancy test. Like one of those, like you hold it in the light and it could be there. It could not be there, which then spiraled my curiosity, but I didn't want to go back to the store to buy a, a pregnancy test because I didn't want to run into any more of my students. So I decided to drive about 30 minutes away to the nearest target and buy a digital test just because I could not handle the idea of waiting another day for a more clear line. Um, so came back home, peed on that stick, and that came back as a clear positive plus, which was super exciting. But again, was home alone and didn't want to tell anyone because I'd, Heath wasn't home back yet from Crater Lake. And uh, I felt like he should probably be the first one to know on this case. So he came back later that night. He actually got altitude sickness from snow camping. And so he was not the most, uh, he was extremely tired. And so I had no really cute way of telling him he was going to be a dad. So just kind of ripped off that band aid and was like, Hey, I'm pregnant. And I wish I had maybe like let him take a nap or something prior to that. But there's not really ever a ideal way of doing that. But, uh, I did later find a meme that I thought was hilarious that I sent him. It was a, uh, when it's April 2nd and your wife is still pregnant kind of gif. And so that was just kind of our <laughs> hilarious. You're going to be a parent announcement to him. Nice. That's so hard to be alone <laughs> going through all that. Yep. Like just wanting to tell him, I'm sure. All right. And so then how was your pregnancy? My pregnancy with Will was pretty easy. I stayed in pretty good shape. Uh, I worked out quite a bit stay pretty active. The only kind of hiccup that happened with the pregnancy was uh, around 22 weeks. I noticed that my anxiety spiked quite a bit. Uh, and I talked to my midwives about it. So I started a low dose of Zoloft just as a preventative measure for after pregnancy because I really was very concerned about postpartum depression. And I just, I wanted to mitigate that risk as much as possible. Also, the other, I guess two other things is I developed PUPS um, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's like pustule something or other. It's basically when your, your belly and arms and any of your stretch marks kind of break out on hives and they don't really necessarily know what it is. I think it could be, uh, as your pregnancy continues to evolve with the pregnancy that you have, your body's having a reaction to the placenta. And so you just break out into these itchy pustule hives that it just won't stop. And so that was a a bit of a hiccup there. And I know people who have gotten it a lot worse. So I'm pretty thankful that it wasn't a severe case, but it was still pretty intense. And then the other thing that just happened was I was just group B, uh, strep positive. So that would be the only thing that would affect my birth plan. And that would just require the every four hours antibiotics. Right. So then on that note, what was your birth plan? Our plan was to deliver at the local birth center. It was a freestanding birth center. The hospital is about five minutes away. Heath was super excited about it. He was actually born at a birth center and he remembers his younger brother being born at a birth center as well. And so um, there's a pretty big age difference between him and his younger brother. And so he was super involved uh, with his mom and his parents at that time. And so was really excited about not having the more medical aspect of a birth. And I was pretty excited as well. Um, Obviously, I wasn't thrilled about the idea of uh, the pain of childbirth, but I was very excited to have a low intervention birth plan at the birth center. So how did labor start for you? So at 38 weeks and four days, I started having a lot of brass and hicks, but it was nothing, nothing timeable, nothing, you know, nothing severe. It was just, I just noticed that I was, my belly was tightening a little bit. 
we kept pretty busy that day. Um, I know we planted some tulips and did a lot of squatting there, went for some walks. I stayed pretty hydrated, but you know, you assume that, you know, you're a first time mom. And so that, you know, it's only 38 weeks. You're definitely going to be pregnant until like 41, 42. You should just mentally prepare for that. So really didn't think much of it. So I went to bed that night and I woke up, I remember exactly at midnight and I felt this need to pee. And for some weird reason, I took my phone with me to the bathroom. And as soon as I sat on the toilet, there was this pop and a huge gush of water. So very convenient that it was in the toilet and not having to clean up this mass amount of fluid. Were you for sure that it was your water breaking and not wondering if it was pee or anything? I was about 100% sure that it was my water breaking. Yeah. I would have been shocked if that was pee. It was a <laughs> complete gush of yeah. fluid. Like It was a definitely different. Um, and if it wasn't my water breaking, I wanted to have a talk with my midwives about what that actually was. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah. Since you, with my third was the first time my water broke before labor. And it was very clear to me that it was my water. But you hear so often about people not being sure. So I was just curious. Yeah, I could see like if it was a trickle, but this was just like the floodgates yeah, opening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so I was sitting on sitting on the toilet and I was trying to yell for Heath. This was about midnight and he was still out in the living room watching a show or something. Um, but he couldn't hear me. So luckily I had my phone with me and I texted him asking him to come into the bathroom. And my adrenaline was rushing and my legs, like my legs were all shaky. I just didn't, I, I knew what was happening, but the adrenaline rush was was there. So he came in and I told him, I, I'm pretty sure my waters just broke. And because I was group B positive, uh, we wanted the birth center wanted us to call them to let them know that, uh, whenever your waters break and just kind of see if it's clear or if there's, uh, anything else that we needed to do. So he helped me get up, uh, and get a postpartum pad on. So that way it would help, uh, with the liquid leaking. Um, and we gave a call to the birth center and they asked the questions like, is it clear? Um, how are you feeling? Are you feeling baby move? Um, it was hard to know if it was clear just because it was a uh, intermixed with urine, but I was pretty sure it was just fine. Um, I didn't see anything green or there was no brown meconium or anything, which is all good signs. So the midwife said, you know, get yourself cleaned up, make sure you eat a snack, but go back to bed. Cause it's going to be a, probably a very long day for you. It's going to be a while. And I absolutely agreed. We laid down some towels and we tried to sleep, um, but around, I was waking up, I, I, we didn't time any of the contractions, but I woke up around 5.30 and I knew I wanted to get out of bed and start just trying to move around. They were starting to get a little bit more intense. So I got out of bed and then we went out, to, uh, Heath and I went out to the living room and I needed, I wanted his help just kind of with breathing through the contractions. We turned on an episode of, you know, Parks and Rec and we just sat on, or I sat on the yoga ball and started breathing through the contractions. And at this point, they were about every five minutes lasting about 45 to 50 seconds. Then around 8 a.m., they really started spacing out and then eventually stopped. And I was super confused at this point. Um, everything from our birth class didn't really uh, lead to this, didn't really uh, say that this could happen. I remember listening to a lot of podcasts saying that, you know, labor can start and stop a bit. But with my water breaking, there is that concern that you're kind of on a clock, essentially. The birth center's policy is that labor needs to be established by 24 hours after your waters break. So we still had plenty of time, but it was a bit of a worry in the back of our minds. So at around 8 a.m., I went ahead and called the birth center and let them know that my contractions were starting to slow down and really stop and not be intense at all. They suggested that we go for walks, we continue eating, but come on in around one o'clock, I think, um, just to get everything checked out and make sure that baby's doing okay. Something that I do want to add is we didn't know the sex of our baby at this time. And so uh, whenever we referred to him, it was always baby or just some other nickname. So we went in, everything looked great. Baby was moving quite a bit. My fluids still looked great. Uh, so they weren't really concerned about any of those aspects. And this is just as going home, continue to walk, continue to eat and try some um, nipple stimulation with a breast pump. And then to come back at midnight, no matter what, for a first round of antibiotics. So we tried everything that they suggested. Um, nothing really worked. I spent a, quite a few hours on the breast pump. Um, which trying to figure that out, uh, when I wasn't quite prepared to have to use it for several weeks, it was an interesting endeavor. Um, I was able to collect some colostrum, which was really cool. 
to be able to put that in the fridge and save it for later. I tried to get some sleep here and there, but it's hard because you have the anticipation that labor could be starting because it's, you know, you've been waiting nine months for this event and then uh, your body isn't really going into the labor that you thought it would be. So at midnight, we went back to the birth center. Our midwife put in a hep lock um, and started an IV and did the first round of antibiotics. Um, she checked all my vitals. Everything looked great. We finished that IV bag and then she sent us home with the hep lock in my hand. So that was nice that we didn't have to do the IV in and out multiple times. And at that point, she reminded us of the the policy about transitioning to the hospital if by the next four hours check in my labor hadn't started. And then around 4 a.m., you know, we went back home around 4 a.m. We had to go back in and contractions. I think I had one contraction in that entire time, and which was super frustrating and was really disheartening that we had spent this entire you know nine months thinking that we we're going to birth at a birth center. Um, and then just kind of having, I wouldn't say my body betrayed me, but just a, a frustration in, in the like, okay, water broke you know, there's a set order of things in my mind that should have happened. And it just, my body was just not necessarily ready to get contractions going. So we discussed, uh, the transfer process. What's really great about this birth center at the time when, you know, prior to COVID is when you transfer, they'll come with you and get you all checked in, uh, make sure you're settled, answer any questions. And then usually when you transfer, they assume you know, you're going to need some kind of augmentation of labor, whether it be Pitocin, you want an epidural. Um, and then they'll go home, try to sleep for a little bit and then come back for the birth of the baby and really act as a doula in that role, um, which was the plan for her. And so I also mentioned at that point that I wanted an epidural. I was exhausted. I think Keith and I had both been up for the day and a half at this point with, you know, very little sleep with our adrenaline running and just the excitement of, potentially going into labor. And so one of the reasons I wanted to be at a birth center is I do have trauma in my background and I really appreciated that the midwives at this birth center were very open and willing to work with me and I developed a relationship with them. And I really, in order to protect myself and feel in control of what was going on around my environment at the hospital, I knew I wanted an epidural at that time. And so we checked into the hospital around 8 a.m. Um, I think they checked me and I was about a three and then something I know that at that point when they checked me, they, they asked my permission if they could check me and I was really unsure. I know I didn't really want any vaginal checks, but they were very much saying like, well, it'll really help us know where we're at. And I, and you know, we can kind of see where your labor is. And I, I tentatively agreed to get checked that one time. And it was nice knowing that I was at a three. It was a frustrating that my water had broken. I was only at a three, but I, I didn't necessarily want to be checked again after that point. So they started me on Pitocin and, uh, in my head. And after listening to a bunch of stories on the birth hour, I was, I knew I wanted to last as long as I could with the Pitocin contractions, um, without getting an epidural so that labor could really get going, um, and really become established. And so at that point, my midwife had had went home, try to get some sleep because she had been up all night with us as well. And she said that she would come back uh, to text her when we reached to 10 and we're ready to start pushing and she would come help and act in a doula role in that way. Oh, just one more quick thing. So, so when I was 15, I was diagnosed with something called tethered cord syndrome, which is a spinal deformity. It's when the spinal cord connects to your spinal column and symptoms of that are leg weakness, nerve weakness, um, as well as other things like urinary incontinence, um, some back pain. It really doesn't affect my day-to-day life, um, but it, it does impact my ability to receive an epidural or spinal, um, which I later found out uh, while I was in labor with my son. Okay, so that'll come into play a little bit later. So around 1230, you know, the contractions were starting to get pretty intense with the Pitocin and I, at that point, really just wanted to take a nap. And I knew it could be a while before an anesthesiologist could come in and give me an epidural. So before the contractions got too intense, I wanted to request one. I felt I was hoping that I had made some progress between 8 a.m. and 1230 with the contractions and that uh, it would be pretty in a pretty ideal time to get an epidural. So this poor, poor anesthesiologist came in who 
got to deliver me the bad news that he could not do, um, an epidural because of my spinal deformity. And it's not something that we really had thought much about because we were going to deliver at the birth center. We were going to be, be there and epidurals were not, not even an option at a birth center. And so we really hadn't planned on how a transfer would look Poor doctor. I felt so bad for him. I had some very choice words for him and there was a lot of begging and a lot of, uh, a lot of yelling on my part in between contractions. And so I don't remember his name, but I feel incredibly bad for him. And I just sent him good thoughts, uh, for how I handled that situation. But that unfortunately sent me into a full blown panic attack at that point. They gave me some nitrous oxide and asked me to like lay in bed and just try to, you know, breathe through the contractions, but then also trying to relax and help my anxiety and panic attack. He crawled into bed with me and tried to help hold me. Um, he also texted our midwife asking her to come back since I was pretty inconsolable. And the struggle was I'm still having these contractions, uh, throughout this panic attack. So trying to calm down in between contractions. Um, I just, any of my birth prep, uh, calming techniques, breathing techniques kind of just went out the window uh, for me. And so, um, at that point, I wish I would have asked them if we could have turned off the Pitocin for a while to collect my thoughts and get a game plan, but I really wasn't thinking as coherently as I wish I could have, but I guess, uh, hindsight is a thing. So going forward, I really, I honestly don't remember much. Um, in between the contractions, I went into full labor land. I know that I had asked for a C-section at one point, just in my mind, that was a way to kind of protect my mental health and just kind of end things because I really did not want to continue to labor with the Pitocin and just feeling that out of control of what's, what's going on. But the OBGYN and the midwives there at the hospital, I don't think they really wanted to do that. I think in their minds, I wanted this birth at a birth center. And so by me asking for a cesarean, I think they thought that in the long run, I would really regret that decision. And I'm not quite sure if, if I would have or not, they just, uh, they continue to try to distract me and push it off. My midwife came back and acted as an amazing doula. Uh, I continued to labor. I know at one point I got their version of birth tub, which was the smallest tub ever. And I'm not a very big person, but you know, a full-term pregnant lady, I want to be able to sit in a tub and actually fit. So that was an interesting experience. I think I yelled that someone should be fired for creating this bathtub and a birthing a suite of a hospital. <laughs> Letting your feelings be known for sure. <laughs> I was very opinionated yeah. on what I wanted. And I'm pretty sure if I had my way, the architect would have uh, lost his job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and hear your birth story then. So... Around uh, seven or eight centimeters, and I, I don't know quite what time this was. It was somewhere, I think, around 8 p.m. Will's heart rate, they kept on losing it. I was on the the fetal monitors that go across your belly. He was just moving around a ton, and so they just could never get a really good read on where he was. And so they decided that they wanted to do an internal monitor at that point, which, again, I understand why they necessarily wanted to do that to keep track of him. Unfortunately, after they placed the first one, they realized the wiring wasn't correct. And so they had to go in and do it again just for proper placement. And so that was not an enjoyable experience. But at this point, again, I was ready to be done. You know, Heath and I had been up for about two days, which, you know, number one advice is definitely go to sleep. Go to sleep if you can. At the beginning of labor, don't stay up like me being all excited. They did offer me fentanyl at one point, which I accepted, just trying to help ease the pain a little bit. The struggle with that was how my body reacted to the fentanyl on top of just being so exhausted was that I fell, would fall asleep in between the contractions, which did help give a little bit of energy. But the struggle was I wouldn't remember falling asleep. And so I'd wake up and have a contraction, but not remember that I actually did get a break in between those. And so emotionally was not doing well coping with that thought that I wasn't getting these breaks because I thought the contractions were back to back and in reality, they really weren't. I had a little bit of space in between them. So that was really hard for Heath to watch and try to support me through that. And because at that point I was not rationally thinking about getting a break. I was not, not going to be told differently about what I, what I thought was actually happening. I'm a very difficult person in labor. I'm very obstinate. Yeah. So 
I eventually reached 10 centimeters. I think this was around 11 p.m. I remember being in the bathroom. So the struggle was because I was on IV fluids the entire time we were there. So you just have to pee a lot, which is normal. And so I would make a lot of trips to the bathroom. And honestly, laboring on the toilet was one of my favorite places. Just felt the most comfortable there. The thing is, I didn't want anyone in the bathroom while I was laboring on the toilet. So I just kind of did this solo. And I remember being in the bathroom and then all of a sudden, like, I had no control over like what uh, sounds I was making. It was like the low, the low moan. And I remember everyone who was in the other room, like just stopped talking and listened to me. And they were all got super excited because it was definitely a transition at that point. So I got back into the bed and they decided that I could start pushing at that point. And I think I pushed for about three hours and just was not making any progress. I make very big headed children. When Will was born, he was 97th percentile for head size. But also I was just so, so tired and just was not pushing effectively. And we tried multiple positions, you know, on my side, squatting with the birth bar. I think it was too, I think, I don't think I said I wanted to try standing. I'm not quite sure, but it just he just was not descending down. My husband, so he said that he could see his head come down and then go right back up, which again is normal, but just not really making much progress. So after about three hours of pushing, the OBGYN came in and asked me if I wanted to do a C-section. And at that point I said, yes, I want to do it. This is, you know, even though it would mean being under general anesthesia, I did not want, I did not want to continue pushing. I didn't think I could do it. I was not able to, I felt physically unable to get my son out at this point. I don't think I, I was just too tired and, and he was still so high up in my body and not coming down. I just, I didn't know how much longer it was going to be. And I just, I wanted to be done. So I signed the consent forms and they wheeled me back. They sent my husband to this kind of public waiting room. And I remember being in the OR and apparently I had another contraction in the OR and my son descended finally. And I'm wondering if it's because my body finally relaxed because I knew I was going to be able to kind of have things be over. And they asked me one more time if I wanted to try pushing. And I said, no, I was done. So they put, they put me to sleep, put me under and I woke up without a baby and didn't know where I was. Will had been taken to to Heath, but they were in a separate room together. And so they were waiting for me to wake up in recovery before reuniting me with my son, who I didn't know was a boy at that point, and find out, you know, just kind of start that kind of process of recovery and breastfeeding. So then how was just like processing everything and a little bit about your stay in the hospital as well as postpartum once you got home? I think I was really shell-shocked. Yeah. Heath and I, we are kind of survivalist people. Like we have, you know, we had a job to do. We had, you know, we had to take care of this brand new newborn who, you know, we're getting to know him and his personality, but we really didn't process what had happened for at least several months. I think I remember one of the nurses saying that we were not acting like first time parents because we were so, I think in our mind, just so relaxed. But I think it was that shell shock of what all had happened and that, that we weren't together for the birth of our son and that we, you know, cause Will and I were separated for about an hour and a half. You know, he found out that we had had a boy by himself in the waiting room. They kind of wheeled him out and gave my son to Heath. And, and that was that we never really processed it for several months after we just kind of took care of the needs of our newborn and didn't, I don't know. It definitely impacted our bonding, our bonding with our son. You know, obviously like we love him to death, but it definitely made us feel a little, or at least it made me feel more detached from him in a way. Cause I was also coping with the fact that my birth had not gone the way I wanted it in any way, shape or form. I had imagined this kind of idealistic, you know, vaginal birth at a birth center. We go home a few hours later and go snuggle in bed. And then all of a sudden we're in this hospital and we have nurses and doctors coming in every two hours to check your vitals and, you know, monitor baby and you. And it just was not prepared for that at all. All right. So I'm interested to hear about when you started planning for baby number two, how, how your thought process was around both getting pregnant again and then also planning for a second birth. Mm-hmm. So we knew we wanted more than one, one child, but I did not want the same experience right. that I had, you know, even if I had another cesarean under general anesthesia, I wanted to go in so much more 
educated and prepared. And I, I had thought that I had prepared myself for the birth of my first son, but I don't think I mentally prepared how to advocate for myself Mm. in the way that would, would have been the most effective. And I don't think I shared my my wishes as well as I should have with my husband. And so going into a second pregnancy, we really decided to dive deep into every scenario that we could possibly think of and really openly communicate what our wishes were and make sure that those were documented in a very clear written birth plan. We, prior to getting pregnant, this would have been you know December 2019, I went and saw an a neurosurgeon, I got a new MRI done at that point to see if we wanted to try for an epidural for a, another for a VBAC, would that even be possible? And everything came back looking like the uh, an anesthesiologist could attempt an epidural, but again, there's always risks with that, with the placement. And you know, it couldn't, it could not work, even if it was placed correctly, there's always that risk. But just knowing Just knowing that we had a new set of MRI scans on file really helped me feel comfortable attempting a VBAC. Our plan was to try having a VBAC in Corvallis with the same set of midwives. And we knew going into this that, you know, we're trying for a VBAC. I felt pretty confident. You know, my midwives also felt pretty confident. I had made it to 10 centimeters. I had tried pushing, but there were so many other mitigating factors that really impacted the birth that they felt pretty confident that I could have a baby come out of my vagina and I felt pretty confident too that I could do that. I just wanted to be prepared for every scenario I could. Well, I take that back. Every scenario except for a pandemic. I was not uh, thinking about that part. <laughs> yeah. You were on our, our early Zoom calls with our Patreon group. And then later you joined the childbirth course and you were on those Zoom calls. But I remember you finding out you were pregnant like right after the pandemic started. Yeah, that was, you know, because I think we, I was in this false sense of, oh, it'll just be two weeks. It'll be fine. We'll all go back to school. We'll mm-hmm. all, things will open up. Yeah, that never happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was a, a unique time. We never really had time to decide whether or not we wanted to pause trying for a baby. Because at that point when we were trying, I think it was you know, March and April, things were still relatively unknown. And like, we still had this idea that maybe things would go back to normal throughout the pregnancy. Obviously, that didn't happen because I found out, I think, May 2nd or somewhere, somewhere around the beginning of that time. So it was really early on that I found out, which is just super exciting. I will say, so my university shut down, I think, March 17th around that week. So I'd been working from home for a little while and it was fantastic going through my first trimester Mm -hmm. at home. I could go take a quick nap. I could go uh, be sick in my own bathroom. It was lovely. I would not recommend a pandemic again, but I definitely would say if you can work from home during your first trimester, I would highly, highly recommend that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you talking about that being a nice silver lining. Yeah. So for the pregnancy, the pregnancy went relatively smoothly for being kind of an isolation. I think the hardest part was feeling connected to, you know, other other people, other moms. I logged on to your the birth Patreon Zoom call and then eventually did the know your options. And that was incredibly helpful, not only for like the birth education aspect, but just feeling this kind of connection to others. Because I know a lot of mental health, you know, mental health is super is hard to cope with right now with the pandemic and just having that connection. It's been the highlight of my every every other week morning meeting. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear you say that. Those have been so great. And again, a silver lining of the pandemic because we weren't doing those before COVID and I've gotten so much out of them, not even being pregnant, connecting with all of you. Mm -hmm. It's fun to see everyone's babies now. Yes, (laughs) it's so great. Especially we've had several people like in the hospital still sharing their babies that were just born and telling us their birth story. So it's pretty cool. I love it. So around... 34 weeks. I did develop pups again. Just going to throw that out there. I feel really bad for anyone who develops pups. I was really hoping that this pregnancy I wouldn't have. So with this pregnancy, I was really focused on, again, my type A personality controlling what I feel like I could control. And so with my son, we didn't find out the sex of the baby and that and then not hearing his first cry was one of the really the hardest parts to cope with and emotionally. Not, I wouldn't say get over the process. And so designing my birth plan was really focused on those two aspects. I really wanted, those were the two things that I felt that I missed the most out of everything. And so every, a lot of the plans that we made, no matter the birth outcome, you know, VBAC or repeat cesarean with a spinal or were under general anesthesia were kind of framed around those two aspects. 
And also because this was the beginning of COVID, we decided to do the genetic testing where they take your blood and they do, they test it for, I think chromosomes or if that's the right word, at eight weeks. We weren't necessarily worried about genetic abnormalities, but we just really wanted to know the sex of the baby just because that's something that I wanted to find out together with my husband that we missed out on the first time. And so we did that and our midwife called us, I think it was around 10 weeks and we found out where you're having a baby girl. So we were going to have one of each. And that in itself was really healing. Yeah, I remember you sharing that news too. It was so exciting. <laughs> right? Yeah, I, uh, I had a hunch it was a girl, but it, my hunches are uh, not necessarily always right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's hear a little bit more about just planning the birth and leading up to it. And then kind of towards the end, I know things changed a little bit for you. Yeah. So we had, we were planning for a VBAC even during the COVID pandemic, we were we wanted to try for a vaginal birth. I we're not quite sure how many kids we want to have, but I didn't necessarily want to have a repeat cesarean if I could try to avoid that just for managing those risks. But also I really almost wanted a redemptive birth, if that makes sense. I really, really wanted to try to have a vaginal birth just because I was so close the first time. But I felt I felt so much more prepared and educated and ready to advocate for myself going into the second birth for a VBAC than I did with my, my first. And so I was feeling incredibly confident that I could try to navigate this, but especially knowing that we had done our research and I had seen an anesthesiologist and a neural a neurosurgeon and had them take a look at my spine. And just, we came at the second pregnancy with so much more information. And so the, the game plan was to try for a VBAC. And if we had to transfer, if I had to have a cesarean, it would be okay. Just feeling in so much more control. So around 34 weeks, my husband and I sat down and had a pretty serious talk about, you know, what we wanted. And, you know, he he disclosed that he was feeling a lot of um, anxiety with trying for a VBAC and just kind of the lack of control that we would have, you know, whether when we went into labor, what could happen. There were just a lot of moving pieces to this puzzle of, you know, what our birth could look like. And I very much agreed with him that I had a lot of anxiety as well. And so after you know, talking it over for a few days and really, you know, analyzing, you know, our feelings towards trying for a VBAC, we decided that it would be in our best, both of our best mental health choices to try to transfer to a hospital and have a plan to see section. And this was at 35 weeks that we finally came to this conclusion. Yeah, it was a late decision, but it seemed like you were really at peace with it and like almost had a little bit of a a mindset shift just hearing you talk about it and post in the group and everything about having that, you know, a little bit of control there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I felt almost relieved in a way. Not that I, I think if I had tried for a VBAC, it would have been fine, but it was definitely nice knowing that I knew what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest struggle is we needed to find a provider that would take a 35 week pregnant um, woman during COVID. All right. The struggle was that I did not want to go back to the local hospital. That was, I just felt that that was going to be too traumatic. And so I, what I decided to do was I wanted to transfer down to Eugene, which is about 45 minute drive. So not terrible, but I just needed to find someone down there that would be in schedule a cesarean. And luckily I found two practices that would, I went and met with both providers. And luckily I have a friend who was a nurse at that local hospital in the labor and delivery ward. And so she was able to kind of guide me on not necessarily who she liked better, but just kind of saying, this is, you know, this is going to be your experience in the postpartum ward. This is what, you know, this nurse really loves her job and she does, and she's amazing and absolutely wonderful. And I love her to death. And she was just really able to guide me and help me make the best decision for which provider we wanted. And so I met with two two different OBGYNs. They were both absolutely wonderful and, and lovely. I decided to go with the first one. Just, I felt like both of them could very adequately deliver the baby. I just had a better, better connection to the first, the first doctor. So we, we scheduled the cesarean for 39 weeks. That would have been January 4th. Got, you know, we got all the uh, surgical paperwork. By the time that I actually decided on this, on this specific OBGYN, it was 30 six weeks, I believe, 36 or almost 37. And so we had 
think one more appointment after that because we were, we then moved on to every every week appointments at that rate. And so part of the pre-surgical work was, you know, getting getting all your blood drawn. You had to go get a pre-surgical COVID test. I'm trying to think if there was anything else that I was supposed to do. I'm sure it'll come back to me. But I was pretty, I was very much at peace with the decision we made. And it was just very point A to point B and getting things planned. Well, let's go ahead and hear the birth story and how that went for you. Yeah. So at 38 weeks, I think three days, I drove down to Eugene. It was a 45 minute drive. And I started noticing having, again, Braxton Hicks contractions, but, and baby was moving just fine. Didn't really think much of it. And my appointment with this OBGYN was about 8.30 in the morning. I get there, I'm talking to her and I'm saying like, I think, you know, I'm ha- I think I'm having contractions, but I'm not entirely sure. Again, it's 38 weeks. It's not, it's not very close to your due date. And so I'm thinking like, okay, maybe it was a fluke that my water broke the first time. There's no way that I'm going to have another 38 week baby at this point. And so she said, okay, well, we'll get you on to get you onto a monitor. We'll just kind of monitor baby. We did that for about 20 minutes. She noticed a couple contractions on there, but both of my babies are just huge movers. And we would just, she would kick off the monitors off in my belly with just her huge movements. And so they're like, no, baby's fine. You know, this could be contractions, but I really, I think you're going to make it to January 4th. This was December 30th that I was having these appointments. And I agreed with them. I said, you know, I think, I think you're right. I think, you know, I think it's just, I'll go drink a bunch of water. I needed to go get my blood drawn for anesthesia uh, and surgery prep. And then I was also going to go get one of those pre-surgical COVID tests a few days later. And so I got my blood drawn, that one great. I started the drive back, was listening to, I think, the birth hour again. And then I started noticing that these contractions were coming every 20 minutes. And they were pretty light. They were not painful in any way, but they definitely were there. And in my mind, I was was having a very internal talk. I was saying, this cannot be happening. I have too many things to do this weekend. I need to go to Costco. I need to make meals. I need to like... We had a plan to get my toddler to my parents' house. My dog was going to go to a friend's house. It was, we had things that we had to do this weekend. So I was having a talk with baby about how she was going to stay in there until the day, until January 4th. And I have learned now in the seven weeks that she does, that she's been alive is that she does not listen as well as I would like her to do. So throughout the day, I was in just a terrible mood. I was a grumpy, grumpy person. And then I just continued to notice that my contractions were getting closer and closer and not stopping. I went and took a shower. I laid down and took a nap. I drank a ton of water. I ate food. I just tried to take it as easy as you can when you're locked up in a house with a toddler and a pandemic. And they just would not stop. So around five o'clock, I called the on-call number for the, the OBGYN's office and asked them like, hey, I have a C-section scheduled for that Monday. What would you like me to do? And they said, okay, we'll keep on timing the contractions. If they reach every five minutes for one minute for an hour, call us back and we'll have you come in. I said, great. At that point, I think they were about every seven or eight minutes. So they were definitely lasting about 50 seconds to a minute, but they, they were definitely there. We decided at that point to call my in-laws and let them know that, hey, you might need to come and take my son. Luckily, they they live about 45 minutes south of the hospital that we would be delivering at. And so they're they're relatively close. So trying to coordinate that would not be an issue. It just, again, was another. The baby was supposed to stay inside of me until Monday. And then about an hour later, the contractions started picking up with more intensity they were coming every five minutes. And so I called the number back and said, hey, this is what's happening. And they asked us to come on in to labor and delivery. And this is about eight o'clock. So I'm having contractions. I'm trying to get my toddler dressed. We didn't even have like his bag packed or bag packed for that matter. And so we're running around trying to get dishes done, assuming that we will not be back to our house for quite a few days. And so that was a little bit of a chaotic time while having contractions every five minutes. I was probably not as patient as I should have been with my toddler, my three-year-old. So we got in the car, we drove down to Eugene. The contractions definitely, they did not stop. Contracting in the car is not the most fun. They were not, they're not super intense, but they were still there very much so. We met my father-in-law at the hospital and we kind of did a, a car swap and car seat swap. You know, said goodbye to my, goodbye to my toddler and, you know, gave, gave my father-in-law a hug and 
said, well, we'll let you know if they keep me or if they send us home that this is not the real thing. So we, we went and parked. We got completely lost. I'm just this pregnant lady waddle, waddling around the, the hospital, especially because there's only certain entrances and exits you can go through now because of COVID. And so we're trying to not break a rule and go through the wrong the wrong entrance or exit. So we, we go check in. Luckily, you know, we got our temperatures checked. We both went upstairs and got checked in to be monitored for a little bit at labor delivery. And so that was a pretty that was a pretty easy process. They put me on the monitor and they definitely saw the contractions, but something that they wanted to do was they wanted to check me. And I was very I was very kind and I was said, no, I do not want any vaginal checks. And the nurses were absolutely wonderful. They said they, they didn't necessarily have a protocol for what to do if someone declines being checked, but that they would figure it out. And I just really appreciated their willingness to work with me on not having a vaginal checks. And they were, they basically just came to the conclusion that they would just keep me on the monitors longer just to kind of see the contraction pattern and how that would go. So they, they got me hooked up to an IV. They wondered if I was maybe dehydrated and if they got me some fluids, the contractions would stop. That was definitely not the case. Contractions can started really picking up on their intensity. They were still about every three to four minutes apart, but they were definitely, I was going to say early labor, but not they, I had to start kind of trying to breathe through them a bit. The on-call OBGYN said, yeah, let's, you know, let's go ahead and move forward with, with doing a cesarean. There was someone ahead of me. Luckily, this is the 30th. This is about 10 PM now. So we're heading into new year's Eve. So there were no other, you know, inductions happening. And so the hospital was incredibly quiet. The unfortunate part was I hadn't gotten my pre, my pre-surgical COVID test. And so that was not an enjoyable experience, I might add, but that luckily came back negative. Yeah, that was, that was not, not fun. I do not recommend that at all. (laughs) Yeah. The little added perk of having a baby during that time. Yep. They, yeah, that's a whole, a whole new thing that I really hope if we have another one, we will not have to repeat that, that whole experience. But that luckily came back negative about an hour an hour later. And that's when the anesthesiologist that was on call came in to kind of review our options. And she, she made some really good points. She said, I'm willing to try for an epidural or spinal at this point, but here are the risks. And I just want to let you know that I'm really concerned about attempting one and it not working. And then you having to go under general anesthesia anyway, and what will be the, the least traumatic for you. And I agreed with all of her points. And at that rate, after listening to all the pros and cons and just knowing that Heath and I had discussed our options prior, I decided that I wanted to have the cesarean under general anesthesia and not attempt an epidural or spinal just to lower the risk of complications with that. That was really a hard decision, but I felt, again, really at peace with it just because I felt so in control of what was happening. It was, I mean, it's it's not an easy decision and it's, you know, not, not ideal, but it's, I felt really comfortable and really supported in that decision. And then the most fantastic nurses came in and luckily it was quiet in the hospital when this was happening, but three nurses came in and they said that we're going to make this the most special experience possible for you and your husband. We're going to make sure that this is as positive as possible. What can we do to help you with this? So one nurse took my phone. We wrote, we took the case off. It's a clear case. We put my phone's password inside the phone case and gave it to the nurse. And she asked me like, okay, so how, what kind of pictures do you want? What kind of videos do you want from this kind of experience? And I said, I wanted my baby's first cry on video. I didn't need pictures of all the action going on down there, but I wanted, I really wanted a video of my daughter's first cry. That's that was my main focus. Another nurse took my husband's phone and, t- and would take pictures with that phone. So we would have two phones with pictures going at the same time. The anesthesiologist was very clear that she would get me awake as quickly as possible. Something else that I really wanted is I wanted them to wait to do the weight and length of baby just to just to try to be a part of that experience, as well as the footprints on the birth certificate. And they said that they would absolutely wait till I was awake. As long as baby was doing healthy and everything was going just fine, that they would wait until I was out of surgery and into the recovery room. The other thing that I made very clear was I wanted my baby to go directly to my husband for for skin to skin. Something that did happen while for my first C-section was he was just kind of left in the dark for an hour and a half. They kept my son. He was having trouble breathing. He just needed a bit of oxygen. It was normal for 
general anesthesia babies to kind of have a little bit of trouble regulating their breathing afterwards. But he was kind of left in the dark, and I really wanted to make sure that he was included in this kind of process. And the wonderful thing about this hospital is where you have your your surgery, the door right next door is the warmer where they'll get checked out. And that's where Heath and our baby would have been together until I came out into recovery. And so they got me all prepped and said it was time to walk to the surgery room, the operating room. Heath walked with me. We we did a really awkward kiss goodbye with masks on, but I walked into the operating room and Heath went into kind of the room where they would take the baby after, after she had been delivered. And I remember my adrenaline kicking in and I could not stop shaking. Anyone who's had a, a cesarean walked themselves into an operating room, you are my hero. That was the most intense and not that I was scared. It just was an overwhelming experience. You know, everything you've got 10 different people in here talking about what procedure they're going to do and just trying to, just knowing that here in half an hour, I'm going to have a baby, but I won't remember it is, it was a very weird feeling. So I got laid down on the table, something that's also not the most enjoyable. So when you have a cesarean with a general anesthesia, they have to put the catheter in first to try to lower the amount of drugs that are getting to the baby. Cause as soon as you're out, they want to get the baby out as quickly as possible. So I had asked for some numbing gel for down, down there, which is super helpful. And I recommend if anyone has to have, have a catheter, uh, to request the numbing gel, but they put that in and then they put a mask over my face and they said, okay, take some deep breaths. And the next thing I knew I was awake in the recovery room and I had a baby on my chest. And I remember looking down and she looked exactly like my son. She was so tiny and I did not think I would have a very tiny baby. I wanted the big, the big roly poly ones. And I've only had, you know, the small babies and I looked down at her and she immediately peed all over me. <laughs> and it was amazing. I was not the most coherent. I was trying, I was trying to take in the moment while waking up from surgery. But I just thought that was hilarious that, you know, I'm meeting my baby for the first time and she just decides to pee all over me. And it was great. So you're like, I love it. <laughs> it, it was wonderful. It was, it was, it, it just, I don't know. It was like the initiation into having a second kid parenthood. I just, I don't know. It was such a great, a great moment. And so they asked me at that point, are you ready to get the weight and get all, get all the measurements? And I said, yes. I mean, I was still groggy at this point, but I remember, I, I remember giving like the consent to do all those things. And so they took her over. She was six pounds, 11 ounces and 18 and a half inches long. So a little tiny, tiny little thing, a whole pound lighter than her brother. And she just screamed and screamed and screamed. And, you know, even, even though now seven weeks later, it's exhausting. It was so nice to be in the same room with her. And I was able to hear, hear her scream. I was able to hear her, you know, cry. It was amazing. I was reunited with, you know, my husband and we were just a family of three. The nurses handed us back our phones and they said that I think that cumulatively they took over 150 pictures and videos. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Like I was able to look through, I have videos of, of her being in the warmer. I have a video of her first cry. Heath was actually able to, you know, watch surgery. Essentially there was a viewing window from the, from where the warmer is. And so he said it was really weird seeing me under, under, you know, intubated and everything, but it was, he said it was very fascinating to watch, uh, watch the surgery happen. He did not faint. He, he did great. Was not lightheaded in any way. He held it together. And I don't know. It was, it was so nice to know that he was as involved as he almost would have been, even though, you know, I was under, cause he, I mean, he missed out on the birth of our son as well, right. as, just as I did. And so having him, I think that that was very healing for him and for me as well. That's awesome. All right. So thank you so much for sharing that story. I just love the way you, like you said, just felt so much more empowered and in control of the decision making. And I remember you sharing about it in the group and just having the biggest smile on my face. So I'm glad you were able to share it here as well. I want to hear a little bit about your postpartum experience and then any resources that you want to share too. Yeah. Postpartum has honestly been great. I think it 
I, I was much more prepared for what recovery of a C-section would look like. I stayed on top of my meds and just kind of got moving as quickly as I could. Sleep has been going really well. Breastfeeding has gone well. I do have a bit of an oversupply. And so we're just kind of trying to manage that with a bit of reflux. But all in all, for seven weeks, it's been absolutely wonderful. I think the hardest part is navigating you know, visitors if we have them with a newborn and COVID. But I think we're managing pretty well. That's good. Yeah, it's definitely been throwing you some curveballs here, but I'm glad you've been able to enjoy this time. All right. And then what are some resources you want to share? Obviously, I know your options birth course. Oh, thank you. Yes, I don't think I would. I mean, just for the education, but then also just the community that it's built. I'm absolutely in love with another podcast that I listen to would be the VBAC link. Obviously, your podcast as well. The other one that I used would be the Positive Birth Company. They just kind of breathing techniques in a childbirth education class, but more of the hypnobabies side of things. Very cool. All right. And then where's the best place for people to connect with you? You can go ahead and connect with me on Instagram at mhopeweb. All right. Perfect. We'll put all of that on the show notes page. And thank you again so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. All right, now we're going to talk to Armina and Michael about their experience using cord blood registry to bank their son's cord blood. Hi, Armina and Michael. Thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. We're happy to be here. Our pleasure. Can you tell my listeners just a little bit about you and your family? Sure. We live in Southern California, and we have two sons, Vaughn, who is six years old, and Sasun, who is three. Michael is a physician. And I was a first grade teacher, but now I stay at home to care of our sons. Very cool. Well, we were connected um, via Cord Blood Registry, so that's what we're here to talk about today. So let's just jump right in and, and talk about what made you guys decide to bank your oldest child's cord blood and cord tissue and how that collection process was for you. So for us, it was actually random. We didn't know about, we didn't even know about banking cord blood until, gosh, it was probably, I mean, I probably had maybe a month and a half left before Vaughn was born. And we were at my best friend's house we were watching a football game. And I think I was inside with him and he kind of turned to me and said, Hey, how's I mean, his pregnancy going? And I was like, Oh, it's going well. And then he asked me, he said, are you guys going to save the cord blood? And I looked at him and that was the first time I ever heard of that. And I said, what, what cord blood? Was, yeah. I, his family's from, from like Damascus and the kind of the Middle East. And I, I looked at him and I've known him since we were four years old. And I was like, was it some kind of weird tradition you guys have from the old country? And he started laughing. He was like, no, man, this is, it's, it's a, they do it here where you, you, know, you bank your children's cord blood and God forbid you ever need it. Um, it's, you know, there's a bunch of stem cells in there. So it's like, it's basically like insurance on your kid's life. And I was like, that was the first time I heard of it. And I thought, oh, that's a great idea. So that night when we got, when we went home, I talked to Armina about it. And uh, I don't know, we thought it was a really good idea. I mean, it seemed like a no-brainer, so we decided to do it. Yeah, and we, we just, when my next appointment came around, we just asked our physician more about it. And he was in partnership with CVR, so he invited us to an informational session one evening. And we went and we learned more about it, and it just seemed like a very good idea and a no-brainer. So then did you have to do anything to prepare during pregnancy or bring anything specific with you to the birth? They send you like a little box, maybe like the size of a binder. It's it's very, it's not too large and it just fits in your hospital bag. Yeah. After like when Vaughn was born, I, the box was in the room and I just kind of looked at her OB and I said, you know, the box is there. And so then they just kind of do everything. You just literally have to bring the box. You sign up and then you bring the box. And then they just knew exactly what to do with it. It was like, oh, okay, they brought it over, collected the samples, packaged it up, and then handed it to us. And at that point, you just call the number on the box, and a courier comes within like an hour um, and picks it up. And that's it. I, my understanding was it is then taken to a cryo unit in Arizona, and that's it. That's where it gets stored. Mm-hmm. Okay, so pretty easy process for you guys. Yeah. It's really easy. So we see that. The dad was in charge. I had no idea it was going right. on. Right. You're like, point. I'm dealing with other things at that the was moment. Dad's job. <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was an easy job. So. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. So let's talk a little bit about why you ended up needing to use Vons, that's your first child's banked stem cells, and what that process was like for you. Well, we actually also banked Sasun's yeah, we, as well because yeah. we just 
you know, wanted to be extra safe. But we ended up using Vons because Sasun was born with SCID, which is severe combined immunodeficiency. And for those that may not be familiar, because I wasn't as a non-medical person, <laughs> um, it's basically if you're familiar with bubble boy syndrome, it's, it's, it's basically where your child is born without an immune system. So they needed a stem cell transplant or a bone, bone marrow bone transplant, marrow. basically. Yeah, so, so yeah, our plan was, I mean, we had no idea Sasson, of course, would be born with anything. So we, we saved his just like we had, we thought von, saving Vons was a good idea. We, so we saved Sasson's. But we were lucky because California is one of the states that adopted newborn screening for SCID, which when Sasson was born, I believe they had only been doing it for two or max three years here in California. So it was still fairly new. So that had been added to the, the newborn screening tests that they do at 24 hours. They do a little heel prick. And so we went home. We had no idea. I mean, he otherwise looked totally healthy. And so we went home, and that's usually what happens. These babies look fine. And so at the one-week point, we got a phone call from the pediatrician. Um, and that's the person who kind of got on the phone with us and said, hey, one of the one of the screening tests was abnormal. And, you know, we said, which test? And she mentioned which one. And, you know, long story short, that's how we discovered that he had skid. And so the traditional treatment for skid is a bone marrow transplant, which, of course, initially we obviously we were willing to accept any option that would potentially save his life. But we weren't excited about bone marrow transplantation because it requires two things, which is one, a bone marrow match from whom then you, you would have to harvest bone marrow. And then number two, the recipient, who would be Sasun, our second one, would have to have his system wiped out with chemo so that it could then accept the new bone marrow. And so, yeah, I wasn't excited. Neither was I. I mean, neither of us were excited about exposing a you know, potentially four or five-week-old kid to chemo. Mm-hmm. It's also just very hard on a baby that young. We know of people that mm-hmm. had really unfortunate experiences with chemo reducing their, their newborn baby, right. basically. Right. And so, again, long story short, uh, at that point, you know, that was our only option and that was what we were ready to do. Um, And so they ran a bunch of tests to see, you know, who was a match. And again, not to get into all the details, but Vaughn, our older one, ended up being 100 percent match, which was great news. Um, and then we kind of started, me and Armia would have our conversations about, oh, no, OK, well, now we got to put Vaughn under general anesthesia. He's got to essentially have, you know, surgery to extract bone marrow from his, you know, his hips, essentially. Um, and then that's when Armina kind of pointed out when I was talking to her on the phone, she was in the hospital with Sasun and she said, hey, I wonder if we could use the core blood for this. And I said, man, that's, that's I forgot about that as a great point. And uh, I said, let me talk to the, let me talk to the doctors at UCLA. So I got on the phone with them and I told them, I said, hey, can, can we use cord blood for this instead of doing a bone marrow harvest? And it was like silence for like 10 seconds. I mean, the guy couldn't believe we had cord blood. Literally, his first question when he finally spoke on the phone with me was, why did you save his cord blood? And I said, what do you mean, why? And he goes, but you, we never, you would never use it. And I go, but can we use it? And he's like, yes. And so I was like, well, then. And he said it was even better than if we had done yeah, harvesting from Vaughn. 100%, like, of course, because we wouldn't have to harvest wait, anything from Vaughn. And then had more count. It had higher counts, but I think more importantly, also, the nice thing about the cord blood is, again, I know I'm sorry this is a long answer, but there's so much to it. Yeah. The nice thing about cord blood is it sits there without ever being educated by someone's immune system. And the reason that's important is because when you transplant bone marrow from one person to another to help them, the problem is you're you're taking someone's immune system, which is essentially what their bone marrow is and you're putting it in someone else. And when you do that, that functioning immune system is going to realize that they are not in their own home and it's not going to like it. It's going to want to reject the recipient and that's called graft versus host disease and that's potentially deadly. And so usually the recipient has to be on lifelong chemo reduction to keep the new transplanted immune system in check so that it doesn't reject them. And that's a problem. With cord blood, that process of educating those cells in terms of who they are and what is self and what is not self never happens. It just sits there in a cryo unit. And so they're like waiting until they get into some system 
to be educated. So when Sasun got that transfusion, those all those stem cells that were vans, technically, they essentially became what they had to become, which were T-cells. And then Sasun's system educated those T-cells so that those T-cells now think that they are Sasun's, not vans. They, they have no idea that they're vans. And furthermore, we didn't have to chemo-redo Sasun mm-hmm. because of what Michael just explained. And Sasun's body took it beautifully. So That's amazing. And you did such a good job of explaining that in layman's terms. So thank you for that. How is Sasun doing today? He is doing great. He is crazy and fun and loud and strong and <laughs> your typical rowdy three-year-old boy. <laughs> so <laughs> really thankful and blessed. Amazing. Well, just on a final note, I know there's so many families out there that have benefited from cord blood um, and cord tissue banking over the years. I'm sure you've connected with a lot of them through your story. But for people who you know are still on the fence about banking, what do you say to them when they ask you about it? Anytime one of my friends or family announces that they're pregnant, we're just so excited for them. And then literally probably the first thing out of my mouth is, you have to court bank, like you, you need to do it. And it's just in this day and age, we ensure our cars and our homes and our electronics and our iPads and our jewelry and literally everything we ensure. And it's just, why would you not ensure your child's life? And, you know, you hope you never ever have to use it. And in the rare case that you do, it's just, you're so thankful and that it was an option. Like I just, sometimes when we think about how this could have gone, if we did not um, do this, it, it would have been an entirely different story for Sasun and Vaughn. And I don't even know where we would be at this point, but um, so just 100% yes. It's not even a question. And CBR is just so great. Like they have such a great um, plan for, and they work with people's budgets of all shapes and sizes. I mean, you think, oh my gosh, it's going to be so expensive. And they really, it's so affordable. Well, they make, I mean, it's like, if you pay it all in one lump sum, it, it is a big amount. And I mean, yeah, obviously they have an excellent payment. They do, and everyone has their own financial situations, and we don't want to make any. You know, we don't want to be like you know, how can you not do it? I mean, you know, some people can't, but yeah, I got to me to our meeting. I mean, that it just seems like a no brainer. Yeah, I'm sure you guys just think about it every day. I mean, I got goosebumps just over and over again throughout your story. So, um, I really appreciate you sharing your experience with me. Of course, yeah. Yeah, we're happy to. We're happy to. I mean, if we can help literally just one family, um, that's everything. So. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for coming on the podcast today. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much again to Cord Blood Registry for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget you can go to cordblood.com and use the code OUR, H-O-U-R, to get 60% off the newborn stem cell bundle, which includes both cord blood and tissue banking. Thank you so much again to Madison for sharing her story with us. If you want more information from her episode, you can head over to thebirthhour.com and search for her name in the search bar. I also wanted to mention our Know Your Options Childbirth course, which Madison was a student in. And if you want to enroll in that, you can go to thebirthhour.com slash course. And right now you can use the coupon code 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. When you enroll, you get lifetime access and you can go at your own pace. So we would love to have you no matter what stage you are in right now. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.